just want to thank you for coming on the show. Uh, it's just it's an honor to meet you, and Robert and I will get into uh, all of your work. So let's just. Robert, why don't you why don't you kick it off, sir? Be the maestro for us. All right. Well, uh, welcome. I, I kind of I did a little bit of snooping. And I realized that Ian and I are the same age, so we were both sixteen when Aliens came out. So I think we both yeah. uh, kind of grew up with that love. And uh, Matthew's younger than us, but uh, I don't. It's just hard to replicate. <laughs> yeah, just a few years. Yeah. But it's hard to replicate what it was like, not knowing what you know until opening night what this movie was all about. Right, you know, yeah. we had trailers and stuff, and there was obviously no no internet and no you know we weren't you know if most we might have had read something in starlog so uh opening night on the big screen was just amazing uh and and i first i kind of want to kind of share what was your kind of first impression of aliens uh as a as a teenager the teenager well i have to kind of preface going to see aliens with the time i saw alien because um, because that was in my head and uh, do you have sports days in american schools you know where everybody has to run a race and do athletics and this is kind of enforced and everybody hates it of but course we had those at our school and i basically played hooky i bumped off sports day with a few friends we went to his house and his dad had got one of these incredible new inventions called a vhs player <laughs> <laughs> I and mean, this was the holy grail you know this was the ark of the covenant you know for, as far as we were concerned and he had two videos uh in kind of rental boxes it was the thing and it was alien and we watched them both while sports day was going on back at the school and i can honestly say although i didn't quite know it at the time that afternoon changed my life you know it absolutely transformed me and, and sort of had a, planted numerous seeds about where i was going to end up I didn't couldn't quite see it at that point. And we got away with bunking off sports day as well. So it was just a great day. Um, then a few years later, obviously the, well, seven years later, the, the sequel comes out. And I am just of an age where I have to see it. You know, it, it's not an issue of whether or when, you know, I just have to see this film. And I do a lot of my film going with my dad. You know, I, I, my parents had split when I was very young. And one of the kind of things I did with my dad was we went to the movies. And again, that was a big influence on, on, on what I do. But I said to him, I got to go and see Aliens. I, and he, yeah, he was always very agreeable. And we went to a cinema called The Odeon in Fulham Road in London. I think it was an afternoon screening rather than an evening one, like a sort of three o'clock, something like that. But it was a pretty full cinema. And, you know, I, I think like most people at our age, you know, I'd seen the trailers, um, but they were very minimal, the, the trailers. They didn't really tell you an awful lot uh, about what this film was going to be like and how different it was in terms of scope from the original film, how much bigger it, it was going to be. And I was just absolutely uh, blown away by it uh, in, in a sense of, I don't think I was kind of, at that point, afflicted by expectations in quite the way I am now, that I, I just wanted to be a good movie mm -hmm. and to be transported. And it just did that. I mean, anyone who's seen Aliens knows how gripping it is and how powerful it is. And to this day, I remember this. And I told this story a little bit uh, in, in making of the film, in my documentary, that at the point where Burke shuts the door on Ripley and Newt, they're all trying to get out, you know, through the infirmary and escape. This guy at the back row, just went, you bastard, you bastard. <laughs> you know, I don't, I, he may, may not have had that accent, but I, I, I'm kind of embellishing the accent. But I just thought he's so gripped. He's so in the moment that he's forgotten he's in the cinema. He's forgotten he's watching a movie. He's just lost in it. And it was a kind of ripple of laughter amongst the, the audience. But we were straight back in it again. We were kind of with him. And then that was the power of the film. It just held us all in a spell. And... You know, I, I think the two films combined, Alien and Aliens, just left a legacy with me where I wanted to revisit that world, even though it was the most terrifying <laughs> place. But it held a, you know, a kind of haunting power over me that I've gone back again and again to explore. It's extraordinary. But it, those, you know, that afternoon to see Alien and then subsequent afternoon watching Aliens. Life-changing stuff, man. Absolutely. I, I, I can't agree more. Um, and I, I had a... Similar experience on, uh, we had a theater here called Indian Hills. And so I think it was 70 millimeters, one of the old Cinerama. So one, nothing seen like that. And just the audience reaction, of course. And then all the way up until the end with Ripley coming out uh, was just like, it was electric. Uh, absolutely. So, um, and, and, I think and the lasting, the lasting uh, legacy on aliens. I feel like there's only two type of people, uh, people that love aliens 
and people that haven't seen it. You know, it's just it's such a great film. Um, and for you to have for for that to have that kind of impact on you, you know, watching um, Aliens Expanded. Uh, you can tell it's it's uh, one of the best documentaries I've ever seen, and it's it's it, it comes from a place of love and admiration where you're like, oh, whoever made this gets it, and you get it, and you yeah. did such a good job. Okay. Um, which brings us to, um, I guess, our next question, which was yeah. the the initial genesis of Aliens Expanded. What was that? How did that process work? Again, yeah, I'm going to trouble you with a long story because all these things always have, have long stories. Obviously, we I, love long stories. We do. Okay. Oh, please, <laughs> you're I'm in like, good company. I won't do my whole career, my whole biography. <laughs> your birth. Um, obviously, I, I came up through film magazines, uh, Empire, and I was on that. And I always covered the alien stuff. That was kind of my terrain within that. And I was kind of like, you know, whatever. You know, whenever any film came up, I think Alien Resurrection, I did all the sequels, all the retro stuff. I did it, and then I did a book called Alien Vault. Um, really on the back of my presence in Empire. What about the making of the first film? And gradually, you know, I, I got a bit of a reputation for um, kind of knowing my stuff and being quite good on camera. And this company called Creative EC, who did In Search of Darkness, did a documentary called In Search of Tomorrow. And they were run by an English guy called Robin Block. And he, he kind of came in search of me and goes, could you be a talking head on In Search of Tomorrow? And the, the things they wanted me to talk about really were, was camera and sci-fi, particularly Aliens, particularly the Terminator, and a bit about the Abyss, you know, absolute, you know, stuff I adored. And I just chatted them for three hours. You know, it was, it was all via Zoom or, or uh, Skype at the time. Mm -hmm. David Weiner was the director, and we just had a, you know, we told a story, we chatted. It was a really great interview because I think we both relaxed into talking about it. And Robin was there. He was there in, in we have called it in my flat at the time, and he was there. And we stayed in touch. And you know, he, he, we sort of talked a little bit along the way about, he said, how would you feel about moving from writing books and being a, a sort of essentially a journalist, writer, presenter, to doing directing? And it always seemed slightly absurd to me. You know, it's one of those things when I was on Empire, I always kind of said I knew where the line was. You know, I was on this side of the line, and I observed what filmmakers do, and then at the other side of the line. Yeah, suddenly I was presented with this idea that I could sort of cross that line and, and make a film. And we talked a little bit about a few ideas. You know, he said, if you, if I was to say, what would you want to do? And we talked a little bit about Stephen King documentary, about, you know, the times where Stephen King works, you know, what were the good Stephen King films? Didn't really coalesce. And I think another team had done a, a very good Stephen King doc. Um, but then we just had a lunch. Um, and... Robin sat me down and goes, I've got this idea about doing what we do with In Search of Darkness and Search of Tomorrow, whole era, but we'll do a whole era based on one film. We'll take the same approach, this kind of widescreen view of cinema, but the subject will be one film rather than a decade's worth of films. And I said, that sounds really interesting, really challenging. And yeah, I may be remembering this with, with kind of roast into glasses. He said, which film do you, you want to do? And we both said aliens at the same time. <laughs> we may not have done, I don't know. It's, it's kind of, you've got to build a bit of mythology into these things. But we both agreed aliens worked because it's a great movie, obviously. It meant a lot to me. And it meant a lot to the people who, who follow it and back it and the fans. That was very clear. You know, I love Alien. I'm in awe of Ridley Scott's film. I think it's a masterpiece. But it's almost kind of a bit like a museum piece. It's kind of grand and, and kind of awe-inspiring. And Aliens felt like your best friend. It was the film that you, you know if it's on the TV, you come in late at night, you're going to put the TV on, and no matter where it is in the film, you're going to see it through. You're going to be there because that's what it does to you. And I thought that passion, that love it engenders in, in all of us, was the key to doing the film. It was the prism through which I would examine the film. Yeah, you know, there's a lot of stuff in it. It's four hours and 14 minutes long, Aliens Expanded. But essentially, I ask one question. Why do we love aliens so much? And there's four hours and 14 minutes worth of answers to that question. You know, it's the characters, it's the world, it's the way it relates to the original film, it's James Cameron's skill, it's just the lines, it's Hudson, it's all these things. And once I had that in my head, it sort of made life a lot easier for me. It made my piece about, you know, obviously when you do these things of a much loved 37 year old film, you're worried about, you're just telling everybody what they already know. You're just going back and preaching to the converted. 
But once I had that passion idea that that would be the prism, I kind of relaxed and thought I can do anything I want. I can talk about anything as long as we talk about it through this idea of you've seen this film as well and you love it as much as I do. Now let's just have a conversation about it. And that's how the film grew from there. That's awesome. So, uh, and, and so, uh, I was lucky. I was I was an early backer, so I got to see the rough cut that you sent out to, uh, or I think it was also kind of a lottery. And so I remember telling Matthew about it. I was like, "Oh, it's so fantastic!" And this was, um, I guess, before and I'm gonna say before and after before Scorny and and James Cameron. But I remember you're asking for comments, and I'm like, and so nothing against those two, but I'm like, I didn't miss them in that early rough cut because there were so many stories that I've never heard of, you know, and it just really let you kind of live and breathe in that world that when you talk about living in that world is like, Oh, I got to live and breathe in this world for over four hours. And, and so uh, what, what was some of the, um, I guess the surprising story that you had never heard of before, or there was a few uh, that, uh, you know, came to mind, but but really what kind of was like, what uh, kind of was like, Oh my gosh, I never realized that. Yeah. It's interesting. You know, the the first wrestling match you have, and it's like the same when you do books is you, you know, your inner voice starts going, Everybody knows all this. Everybody's heard them before. They've all watched Superior Firepower, which is a terrific documentary you know, that's on the box set. You know, you're, you're doing nothing new. And that sort of haunts you the whole way through. And so in doing the interviews, you kind of like have to rely on your interviewees to kind of give you stuff. As much as you can, you can always sit there and go, tell me a story you've never told anyone. And they'll be like, what? <laughs> so you have to kind of get it out of them. And there were things I did where, I would do a story I kind of knew everybody knew, but I'd do it in an expanded way. So the famous James Cameron tea lady story, which is one of those great aliens myths. I thought, I can't ignore it. I'll just go deeper. I'll go deeper and wider than anyone's ever done. And Cameron, of course, steps up and and just tells it gloriously, like a giant anecdote within the film. But there were other things that sort of emerged I thought were just wonderful. I didn't know the stuff about um, Lance Henriksen bringing knives in through an airport to do the, the famous knife <laughs> scene. Poor old Gail Ann Hurt having to get him out of the airport before you know he, he got sent back to America or even arrested. Um, there was really nice stuff that was sort of thematic. Um, Sigourney Weaver talked really intuitively. She says a lot of people talk about the fact that it's a mother-daughter relationship with Newt. And she said, of course, that is true. But she said, I often saw her as two sisters because they'd both been through the same experience and they both were coming from the same place. And they're the only two in that whole battalion of people who understood what they were facing. And I thought, I've never thought about it in that way. The Newt is kind of like a miniature version of Ripley. Hmm. She's survived where everybody else has died. She's the absolute mirror of, of Ripley. I thought, that's great. You know, I'd never conceived of it that way. And there are lots of lovely thematic things um, that kind of took general ideas that I kind of knew and I think a lot of people know about the film, but just sort of addressed them in a way that I thought was just fantastic. Um, the idea, you, know, you don't want to dwell on too many things that might make it pompous, but I wanted to talk about feminism. I wanted to talk about the character of Ripley, but everybody who talked about it did it in such a smart, cool, interesting way. It became a sort of symphony within the film that everyone could just talk about it going, and, and, Sigourney was just wonderful at the end. She goes, it's just women doing what women do. And, you know, <laughs> they're getting stuff done. And I just loved that. It's just so wonderfully Ripley-like. It's a pragmatic answer. She doesn't go off on one big sort of political thing about feminism. She just goes, it's women getting stuff done. You know, and I thought, that's great. Yeah, getting stuff done by killing the alien queen. Absolutely. But, yeah, that was just magnificent. But uh, yeah, throughout, it was a sense of, you know, once you've got a kind of assembly and you kind of know to some extent what story you're telling. As you do interviews, you can feel them, you know, just improving your story. That's adding color and texture. The joy of James Cameron was obviously I'd done a lot, and you'd watch the rough cut without James Cameron. So I was kind of adding him to the rough cut in my head as we we spoke, and I could just feel it working. I could just feel him sort of take a little nugget and just expand it. You know, he talked about. Is this another bug hunt? That great line that Hudson does. And I just said, well, did you conceive of, of other aliens? And he just gives this great answer about, yeah, it's colonial space and there are other planets. Are there alien, intelligent alien species? Well, I don't know. We don't go there. You know, and I'm thinking like, yeah, now I'm thinking about it. Could there be? You know, and it's 
it's kind of what you want. He's a lovely mix of, he's a brilliant filmmaker and a great sort of self mythologizer and a great you know anecdotalist. He's just a geek. He just loves to talk about sci-fi. He just loves to talk about these things. So you get that lovely relationship of like. It's a film, you know, about fandom and about fans. But it seems to me that the filmmakers themselves are fans. Yeah, you know, they are. They enjoy the discussion as much as anyone. And the the other thing uh, that I also thought was great that James was able to bring to the table that obviously we all talked. They all talked about Bill Paxton, but he probably had worked with Bill the most. And yeah. so obviously that's a a void uh, for all of us, obviously in, in the alien universe, as well as uh, kind of uh, cinema and so forth. But uh, I thought there's probably nobody else that could probably speak to, to Bill yeah. more than James Cameron. Yeah. It's so interesting. It, yeah. He, he's, he's not naturally an emotional guy. He's very enthusiastic and you get a lot of energy off him, but I don't, wouldn't say he was naturally someone who talked emotionally. And then you, what you do with the documentary is you, you kind of build things with different personalities. So you, you, you want to do a piece on, on uh, Bill Paxton. And so you just have them all talk. And it's the kind of juxtaposition of very emotional people because Mark Rolston and Cynthia Scott and even Carrie Henn get a bit emotional. You see them always tear up. Whereas Cameron is a bit more kind of straight. And yet he he's Cameron. So you just have put these pieces together and you can just feel it work. Um, what, what was really important to me, um, and I've got four hours to do it in it, you know, four hours to do it in, is that it's, it's a chorus of voices that, of course, Cameron, it becomes your backbone. But, you know, it, it's an expanded, you know, it's got aliens expanded. And I wanted all the cast to talk. I wanted them all to contribute. And all these kind of other people I spoke to that, you would feel that lovely rhythm of other voices coming in and would create its own energy within it and it creates its own emotion too. That's awesome. And the other thing I want to touch on is uh, Gail Ann Hurd, which is sometimes I feel like she's oh. left out. And I, I also compare her to Deborah Hill, who's sometimes just left yeah. out of like the Halloween legacy. Uh, you know, we, we focus a lot on John Carpenter, but Gail Ann Hurd was the, and, and it was even elevated more through the Aliens Expanded. She was behind everything making sure you know she was she was getting the, she was getting stuff done <laughs> and, he was, he and was absolutely getting stuff done and she's and she took a lot of crap on that film you know this died in the wall british crew who were horribly sexist and old-fashioned who were giving cameron a hard time they're giving her a hard time well i love this a great little sort of throwaway comment from lance henriksen where he goes and get iron her to come along and she's feisty man you know she's this big but she's feisty and you just thought yeah she she was feisty she could deal with that whole british crew she could deal with everything and she created the space i think for cameron to be cameron yeah i think she, she's actually was a great gatekeeper because he yeah as we all know he demands a lot from his crews and, it, and it's very willful and can step over that mark a little bit to get what he wants and I think it's often Gail Ann, that's something in that era, who allowed him to sort of get away with things for the sake of the film. But I think she policed a lot of it and defended a lot of what he did. And I think she was vital, vital to the creation of what you know, the Terminator is and what Aliens is. And she's spicy as ever, I could just tell during the, <laughs> the, the interview. <laughs> yeah, she's not great. messing around. Yeah. I love it. She's so... I, what's so glorious is you get people who sort of fulfill their part of it. So Sigourney Weaver is kind of Ripley like, and Michael Bean's talking a bit of Hicks about him, and Cameron, of course, is Cameron. And Gail Ann Hurd comes across as a producer. When she tells a story, she gives it to you factually and detail. You know, the stuff about James Remar is kind of eye watering in the way she sort of tells it. <laughs> okay, you want to know the James Remar story? Here we go. You know, I got him saved from prison. That guy bought a speedball. You know, she no crap. We're going to tell you it as it is. Yeah, there was no sugarcoating with that, which no is great, you know, because, you know, we've heard, you know, the bits and pieces and people kind of being, I guess, nice about it. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, that, uh, she, she's fantastic and continues to be. I told Matthew one of my regrets in life <laughs> is I, uh, the one time I went to San Diego Comic Con, I was walking through and I was walking by this restaurant and out comes Gail Ann Hurd and I was just kind of thrown and I was like that was my chance to interact with her and I I did not but uh but but yeah she's still a force to be reckoned with oh totally but with she enjoyed that interview what's you know what's 
very, I, I was giving sort of uh, advice to anyone who wanted to make a documentary and certainly of this kind is you have to make the, the interviews entertainment within themselves. So you have to get your interviewee to enjoy themselves. It's not an interrogation. You know, you have to, and, and once they start enjoying themselves, you can just see the personality rise and the stories rise up. So Paul Reiser, you know, he's a former stand-up. So you've got to let him be funny. You know, you've got to let him be dry. You know, there's no point sort of wanting him to be like, you know, factual and detailed. He's just not going to do that for you. What he's going to do is be funny and, and ironic and give you a different pleasure than other people do in the film. I got to give you, of, yeah, sorry. I, I, I was, no, I was just going to say, I got to get hats off to you. I mean, um, from a director standpoint to, to be directing such a source material that's so close to your heart. Um, I feel like four hours was too short. You could have done 16 hours. Uh, I mean, I wrote the cut version, but you did such a good job of like honing in. Um, you could, uh, somebody could watch this knowing nothing about aliens and still appreciate. And that would, bring them into and turn them on to it. And I think you did such a great job from a fan and a director of finding the right balance and really invoking and, you know, ultimately the final cut of just the perfect product. Like I don't think you could add anything to that. It was just such a good, great job of, of honing that in too. Well, it can't be easy yeah, as, a, yeah, as a fan. It's, yeah. It's not easy. Yeah, I, yeah. You saw the longer, rougher version before Christmas and you know, the art of compression is is very difficult because there's bits you love and really choice quotes that suddenly start floating in the, in the edit. They sort of seem to drift along on their own in a, in a bit. You're like, why is that there? Yeah, you know, but you realize it's there because you love it. And in the end, you're it, the film tells you things. It sort of once you put it together, it starts telling you what it wants to be. I know it sounds a bit pretentious, but it kind of does. And you start to realize that it all becomes about how you come in on a point and how you go out of a point. The kind of it's like music in a sense you it's what's what's your rhythm and you start to realize something feels like a great out point do it even though the bit after it might be really good and it might be really telling and you know there's the the tea lady story and there's a whole lot of stuff that i had after that all about the fighting with the, the first ad and you know extended stuff about the troublesome british crew but as soon as he says there's no more, after that, there was no more tea. And it's just a beautiful full stop that Cameron gave me. I remember the editor going, just don't put any more in, just stop there, it's so good. <laughs> it just says it. And he's absolutely right. Like you can imagine the rest, you stop, you do this. So I took out about 10 minutes after that of arguing, you know, Cameron talked about the British crew because it, he told it in that tea, leaders, tea lady story, he told you everything you needed to know about his relationship with that, that crew and how hard it was. So you start to trust the watcher. What you start to trust is the viewer will know what you're doing, that they'll be able to sort of expand in their own heads on the, on the bits you give them. That was a real tough lesson for me to learn because, you know, I come from a, a book background and where, you know, encyclopedic is good. The more detail, the better. Yet here, I had a really good editor. His name is Sam and Samuel Way. And he's really good. And he gets him this, this kind of, this, he gets him to me, Documentaries are a vibe thing. It's a vibe thing. You, know, you let people have a vibe and that's all right. You know, that's enough. And then I, I went to a talk about sort of halfway through the editing process. Thelma Schoonmaker was doing <laughs> at the BFI in London. And she just helped with the edit of that Powell and Pressburg documentary. She, you know, Scorsese had done, presented. And she just said something that was so good to hear. She said, a great documentary doesn't answer questions. It asks more questions. And I thought, that's what I needed. I thought, that I just need that. You know, you don't have to think your documentary is a full stop. And this is it. You know, I like, you know, hopefully people think it's definitive, but it, it should be definitive in the terms of, now you can go away and have 100 million more thoughts about aliens and have 100 million more conversations because this is not the end. This is just another conversation you love to have about one of your favourite films. But keep going. This isn't an end to anything. It's a, it's a journey. And I just took that and went, Oh, thank God, Thelma. You kind of saved me from the panic I had inside me. I thought, I've got to solve every problem. I've got to answer every point. Well, it's you did your job. Made. You did your job yeah. proper because there's so many things in there that, you know, I, I didn't know and that you 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 look at it and you go, oh, that's really interesting. But then what happened here? And 
it leaves you with a lot of questions. And that's part of the adventure and the excitement is like, oh, I want to know what happened there. And let me think about this. And what would this do? And uh, I mean, you just nailed it in terms of leaving you wanting wanting more with the material. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting thing. You know, I, I will always look at it and go, wow, but that feels like too much on that or feels like, you know, you know there's, there's again another cliche that you, you never finish a film, you're just dragged away from it. And there's a little bit of that. I kind of understood that even up to the, literally the night before we delivered the the, the, the kind of the, the the digital version of it, me and the editor were still going, but we could do this at the beginning. How about we do this? And we go, we had to go stop talking like this because, you know, we've got to get, you know, and the producer Robin was a bit like, you will hit this deadline. You know, if, <laughs> if I have to come round and beat you with a club, we will hit this deadline. Fan, so, fans were waiting. They were waiting. Fans yes. were waiting. And it's yeah. No more. You're like, okay, okay. Was there one thing that you just like, oh, I hated a cut or something that was in that rough cut, but just didn't quite make it? There's, I'm sure there's one nugget that you might might have wanted to hold on, hold on to. No, I, it's funny. There, there, are, there are a few things. There's a really nice bit. I would put it in as a deleted scene of Alec Gillis talking about Cameron's cipher. Alec Gillis is, um, you know, special effects. He was working with Sam Winston's team on Alien. So he was very hands-on during the production. And he's a really great talker on film. He just had a natural gift for it. Yeah. So he was a great voice throughout. And he had a, we had a lovely sort of little chat about the style of sci-fi that Cameron does. And it's really, I really liked it because he really sort of nailed the idea of Cameron making realistic films, but with a, a kind of far-fetched element to them. Oh, this is so good. And I had it in the cup for ages. But as I say, at some point, it just seemed to be floating in the middle of a lot of discussions about other things. And I couldn't make sense of it. That I couldn't get into it from another point or out of it. And that tells you that it, maybe this needs to go because it's not doing anything. It is now a deleted scene that'll be on the Blu-ray. I, I perfect, love that. Perfect. <laughs> yes. <laughs> So but there's like we want more yeah Thank as you. much as four hours is great it was like oh we always want more and i'm glad we live in a world now with um and i, I don't know if crystal lake memories was one of the first one where we have these long expansive you know we're not commandeered to you know the either the 20 minute whatever's on the blu-ray kind of this kind of smooshed together that uh we get these these great things like that and robodoc and and where we can just really just gestate and kind of relish with all yeah, these kind of great that's, things it's kind of the ethos was you know, don't worry about length. It was like, this is meant to be luxuriant. This is meant to be like a Criterion edition. You know, this is meant to be something that, you know, I've, I've had a few reviews where they go, why is it so long? And you kind of want to go, hey, that's the point. You know, it's 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 not, you know, it's not designed for theatrical, this four hour car. It's not designed for you to sit there with your backside aching. It's designed for you to be at home and, and just watch it at your leisure, or watch it all in one go, if that's your pleasure. Watch it in pieces, if that's what you want to mm -hmm. do. But it's yeah, you know, it's a kind of companion to you. It's it's kind of a, a friend you can have a discussion with. That's kind of what it's meant to be, though. So the length for me became a bonus. It wasn't mm. length for its own sake because you wanted to cover a lot of things, but also it's like yeah, yeah, you know, we want to indulge ourselves because it's a great movie. You know, so let's just do that. I actually forced myself to split it up because otherwise I would. <laughs> but also, I just wanted to you know enjoy it as a uh, kind of. Ex expand my enjoyment no pun intended so <laughs> and the the idea too that it's uh you know it doesn't feel like four hours and that's that's part of a, of a great documentary um but also the timing you know uh it's, it didn't come out in 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 96 didn't come out 10 years ago like the fact that you got everybody together uh 2024 yeah. and had just this conversation i mean it's just the legacy that this documentary is going to have um, I don't think we can we can really foreshadow that. It's fantastic. Um, but to do that now is just it's it's a beautiful thing, you know. Yeah, yeah, it's it's yeah, nostalgia is, it gets bandied around as a dirty word, you know. It's like, oh, yep. it's, mm -hmm. everyone's just nostalgic, you know, it's a terrible thing. And I kind of want to go, why? You know, isn't that what we love? Is it's kind of just, you know. The things in the past, are, you know, that, that was that phrase, the soundtrack of your life, you know, the music you've always listened to. It's a biography of you. And that's probably true of the films you love, too. They are, they say lots of things about who you are and what you love and, and the kind of person you are. I used to work with an, an editor in very early days. He used to say that I couldn't like someone who didn't like The Godfather. And he meant it seriously. He said <laughs> I just could not like them. And I can totally get what he's saying. I get it. 
Yeah. Yeah. You know, like, yeah. If they were that ignorant, why would I want to like them? You know? No, of course not. Very unforgiving. But and yeah. I said, same for me and aliens. If you didn't like aliens, I don't think I could like you. you know? <laughs> There's nothing more to talk about. Yeah, we're, we're done. It. We're done. Yeah. <laughs> if you don't like planes, trains, and automobiles, there might be something wrong with you. I might have to, we should have some surveillance to you. If you do not like John Candy, you will never be a friend <laughs> of mine. Yeah, you know, you're not, you're not, yeah, you're not a human. It's just, it's, it's facts. Uh I should say I did. I brought up my my stompers today, yes. so they they rarely uh, leave the box. Uh, as as Matthew knows, that I was like, "Oh, it's a special day," and I I got the Waylon Utani shirt, of oh, course. Exactly. So, as we all work for the company, you know, all, we all work for the company. The company Manufacture those, by the way. <laughs> Takes decades. Speaking of, we always like to ask people. Uh, I'm sure you have multitude. What's your favorite aliens quote? Ooh, ah, uh, yo, it's tough. I mean, everyone loves the the, the, the Hudson ones because um, they're just so beautifully timed and and yeah yeah they, they are the pressure valve releasing give you a, a kind of gasp of oxygen. I you know from the first time I saw it you know and this is true of a lot of fans I think while we adore Hudson Hicks is the one you know Hicks is so cool and you know I just love the moment and you know I was sixteen and. Starting to understand a lot of well, trying to understand the opposite sex and and all that, and that's that moment where you know they they have been to the nest and it's all gone wrong, and they're in the APC deciding what to do next, and Ripley of course comes up with the right plan because she always does, you know, let's go to orbit and nuke them all from orbit, and she says it, and it's a lovely pause and a great bit of Michael Bean acting, tired, you know, looks up at her. And agrees with her. It repeats back, you know, it's the only way to be sure. And it's just a lovely romantic moment, isn't it? It's mm -hmm. where they look at each other. Oh, truly. The connection. He respects her. He understands she's kind of in charge now. And you just, you want to cheer. You know, you just want to go, yes, yes. You know, this is just, and it's what Cameron is so good at and doesn't get a lot of credit for is his depiction of humanity, human foible human sort of idiosyncratic interactions, romantic things. He's really good at them and does them on the fly, does them in the midst of chaos. And you just want to get a heart melting moment about nuking a whole planet, basically. <laughs> but that's Cameron for you. It, it is. I, you're right. I think sometimes he gets the uh, kind of popcorn movie director, but everything is rooted in kind of that relationship. And, and when you talk about nuking, I always think about True Lies where it, yeah. the, the the kiss between Jamie Lee and Arnold, and meanwhile on the background is a nuclear explosion, and, and that's just so Cameron that that's kind of uh, the relationship is what's uh, yeah. in main focus. So, Matthew, I think I probably know what's your favorite aliens quote. Of course, yeah, you can just kiss all that goodbye. <laughs> we we say oh, that this, line this, a lot. This bullshit oh, that you that. think is so important. <laughs> And I feel like aliens, and I, I think I can speak for Robert on this. We use these quotes in like everyday life more than with like subconsciously thinking about it. You know, like if somebody messes something up, did IQs just sharply drop while I was, you yeah. know, it's like it's so ingrained <laughs> from seeing it and it's just so timeless the dialogue, you know. That's, that's usually my quote when I come back from vacation. <laughs> did IQs just drop sharply while I was away? I've already told you. Um, but uh, yeah, and you also reminded me that obviously being in Omaha, Nebraska, opening night, uh, and when the line is, you know, there'll be a cloud the vapor size of Nebraska, and everybody, you oh, know, yeah, yeah. goes a little a little bit crazier yeah. than usual. So, uh, but thank you for sharing so much about Aliens Expanded, and I knew, I know you have kind of something new on the horizon. I want to hear a little bit yeah. about. Well, you know, success is in keeping moving. You know, it's the the shark theory that yeah, you just want to keep swimming and. Keep going and we were talking during the making of aliens it took a long time um what would we do next and what film would fit and we talked a bit about blade runner and we talked a bit about this one i really want to do is back to the future um which i have a, a very very different film but i have such a love of that film and i think it's one of the best screenplays ever written um it's so tight it's the tightest I'm one so yeah. Tight. yeah i'm advertising now to my boss going we've got to do back to the future um but the thing was something that we just kept returning to. The thing just seemed to fit the bill. And for different reasons, obviously it was, it was that my double bill of Alien, the thing that changed my life. So it goes back a long way for me personally. Um, it's, it, it covers that sci-fi horror border country that Alien and Aliens does as well. 
but it has a, a different style. You know, it's a very 70s feeling film. I know it came out in 82, but it's a kind of 70s movie. Carpenter is a cynic and a wonderful cynic, and his viewpoint of humanity is darker than, than Cameron's. It's a film invested with an enormous sense of the unknown rather than known. When you watch Aliens, Cameron kind of shows it to you. You know what's going on, you know, you beat by beat. You, you know, it's not a mystery what's happening. It's, you know, it's a disaster film in a sense. Whereas you watch the thing and it's what you're not seeing. It's what you don't know. It's like, who is the thing at any one point? is so compelling and so fascinating uh, that we just thought this is a great one to do next because it will have a different feel. It'll have a different texture. It won't be the same as Aliens. It's much more about pondering, you know, the narrative and sort of pondering what it says. You know, it's one of those great sort of tabla rasas, you know, the, the great sort of templates in which sort of metaphors can be placed. You know, the thing, is it about... Uh, politics is it about nixon you know is it about trump you know is it about those kind of things or is it about you know disease you know we just came out of a, a pandemic where we kept hearing about the you know the virus is mutating it's changing you know it's a new virus now and you keep thinking this is the thing man <laughs> this is like... <laughs> so you think that so you think gosh, this is a terrific piece of, of of art in a sense because it speaks to any era it speaks to different things so you think oh, so much in it to to talk about I think it's going to be a very different film, as I said. I think it's going to have a, a different feel. The, the, the thing will tell me what it wants to be, in a sense. But you want to talk about Rob Bettine and those incredible special effects. You want to talk about the mythology. You know, I love this idea that when you see all the mutations and all the kind of creature changing, what you're get, getting is a kind of its journey across the universe. You know, all the different planets and life forms it's, it's encountered. God, you know, they're kind of weird and wonderful ideas that they came up with that sort of showing you a kind of life out there in the void. And I thought all that stuff's just fantastic. Yeah, you know, it's a really tight, claustrophobic little thriller where you're locked in one place and you don't know, these people don't like each other very much. You know, it's a cold film in so many senses. So, yeah, I'm very excited uh, about doing The Thing Expanded. I think it'll make a great double bill with Aliens. You know, I, you know, lock out an entire week for that because it's going to probably be really long. Yeah. But, um, bring, bring it on. You have to. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting. And that's also what will be different is, you know, Aliens was number one out of the gate and it just kind of went to the stratosphere as opposed to the thing, limped out of the gate and its journey to kind of become the classic that it is took a while. And it wasn't yeah. in 1982. Obviously, we know there's a lot of different between E.T. and, and a number of, of reasons. It wasn't that smash uh, that Aliens was. No, it's it took a discovery. There, there's a, a kind of thing you have to kind of uh, negotiate carefully is that there's the darker story involved. There's a flop. And although since rather like Blade Runner, which came out in the same summer as well, you know, they've been absolutely rediscovered and become almost holy items. You know, there was a, a difficult beginning. And, you know, one of the things about the expanded format that's become clear to me is that you don't want to do the why did a film fail story? You know, what is why did, they wanted the Heaven's Gate thing? You don't want to get mm -hmm. caught up in the cynicism that can come with being cool about stuff. Um, because you want to talk about passion and fandom and, and continued love. So we've got to kind of tread around that and explore that. But I think what, what is true is what you're saying is that it had its incredible rebirth and rediscovery and just became this really important film when the reviews that summer were just catastrophic and you think did these people see a different film to me you know what, <laughs> yeah. what are they on what are they were watching they so kind of caught up in the et you know feel good thing oh, they were so yeah. happy on a cloud nine after et uh, it just was like this kind of coffee this kind of swig of bitter coffee afterwards I yeah yeah i know and et gets blamed a lot but i'm like we we can have both, you know. Um, we we we, also, we do. Yeah. 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 Et is not a feel good movie. Have you no. watched Et recently? That film is traumatic. No, no it's <laughs> it's depressing. It's great, but you're it's very sad. It's disheartening. Yeah. It's very sad, and it's really hard to take. I don't know why everyone thinks it's a feel good film, but anyway, it did get rather kind of steamrolled by by Et. Yeah, but uh, um, but that'll be great, and obviously a lot of the fellows are still around, and uh, yeah. so I think that there's a, a a lot to be had, and I'm sure there's. Probably the same many stories that will be uncovered. Yeah, hopefully. Yeah, 
and again, I, I, I'm trying to use that prism again of this is all about our love of the thing. So I will be at ease like, going back in and talking about the ending and, you know, the breath and all those kind of different things. Mm -hmm. But we've got to give it a new light. We've got to give it something that the pre-existing, you know, appreciation hasn't already given it. You've got to go, you've got to expand, basically. And if you're not expanding, you're failing. So that is my job now, just to kind of make the thing and just mutate it and grow into something hideous <laughs> and exciting. Um, and I want to tell people, so um, before we forget, so Alien Expanded, you can buy it now. So because it, uh, I know you was kind of set up kind of uh, to the backers. And so is it aliens-expanded.com, I think. That's it, yeah. yeah. All right. And then, uh, uh, so for the thing, is that, is that going to be unveiled uh, yeah, in this kind thing. of similar we're, format? That, that, I mean, it's probably a little bit of editing, but that will, if we're always the eight, will now be live on our pre-sale. So things will be moving. And yeah, so you can, I have to think, I don't know exactly when it finishes, around about August the 8th. Amy will be better at this, the PR. I should know <laughs> these things, I really should. But um, Amy's yeah, fantastic. Amy, yeah, we'll be like, yeah, Amy's so good and she knows things and I kind of just like make them up. Um, <laughs> <You're fine. laughs> and I know it's yeah, going to tell. Pretty say we'll be live and we'll be doing that. So there will be an opportunity to, to back the film. Yeah. Gotcha. And, and then for your, tell, go ahead. No, I was going to say for your project after that, keep Robert in mind as guys that can keep the coffee warm from set to set. <laughs> um, we'll be available. I'm just throwing it out there. I'll, we'll make, we'll come across the pond. So not a problem, Ian. I was going to say one of the bonuses for, I'm going to tell the audience, for uh, when you're a backer, then sometimes you get little these little things along the way. So you kind of, uh, which was kind of a, a nice uh, to kind of kind of keep it going. So it did feel like sometimes it's like, oh, it's taking forever. You know, I I, I want to see it now, but it was kind of nice I, to have those I, little I things. I only apologize. No, it's okay. Yeah, it did take forever, but when you get a call that says James Cameron might be interested, you kind of have to stop everything and go. Sorry, guys, we're just gonna put the brakes on now because we've had this call. <laughs> And once you had that call, these other calls started happening, you know, and I'm like, I've just got to follow this through now. And then, oh, of course, absolutely. the last call was Sigourney Weaver. And we just had to go, guys, I know, but we've got Sigourney Weaver now as well. So she was milking that. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she she knows her power in Hollywood. So. <laughs> she knows the score. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you so much for for sharing your, your time with us, and thank you for bringing us Aliens Expanded because uh, this you. is for fans like Matthew and I. There's just there's nothing else like it. It's the best. Yeah, thank you so much for 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 on behalf of our entire generation and the United States and the world. Thank you, sir, for bringing this to. You are show. you are very kind. You are very kind. I'm just glad people like it. I know that sounds like you know humble you know humble bragging. I really like you just kind of the, your first board of court is like, do you like it? You know, is it any good? Because I've just been living with it for two years. And after a while, you can't see it anymore. It's all a bit snow blind. You just need someone to tell you it's all right. Is it in focus? Can you hear it? <laughs> yeah, I can only imagine that it was just like, especially at a four hour, four hour length. I mean, it's not like, oh, let me just give it another run through today. I mean, that that's a lot to take on. It is, it is, but it's great, you know. And there's just bits that were done really early that just stayed as they are. And I spent, I can't remember doing that bit. <laughs> yeah, it was so long ago. <laughs> good, good. Uh, you, well, you did a great job, and and thank, thank you, you so much um, for taking the time. Uh, we just really appreciate it, and we look forward to the next big thing from you. Thank you, thank you. All right, sir. We will. Uh, we will be in touch, and um, thank you, everybody. Could please go check out the documentary alien expanded if you have not and also the alien vault book uh and other works from Ian that you can find on amazon and everywhere else and uh we will talk to you soon thank you sir thank you thank you guys thank you very much thank for you praise as well you're very kind oh i love i i even i told i brought the uh aliens book because i i've had oh, yeah. the novelization yeah and then um i didn't realize until the documentary i probably vaguely remember that they took out all the swear words i know i, know. <laughs> I was like is that i got true? my copy I, too from robert yeah. thank you <laughs> I looked it up and get away from her, you. Get away from yes. her, you. So that might be our new our new line. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we'll let you go. So thank All you right. again. Cheers, Great guys. to see you. Thank, thank you for you your so time. Bye-bye.